actually the first meeting uh, of Project Go Pink around a kitchen table. And um, the reason that I joined Project Go Pink, uh, my life took an unexpected turn on a uh, refuel stop of Air Force One in Alaska, heading to the Beijing Olympics and getting off the plane. Um, President and Mrs. Bush were arguing back and forth on how to properly pronounce the governor of Alaska's name, whether it was Palin or Palin. Six months later, uh, three months later, I found myself um, on the campaign trail as a senior advisor to Governor Palin and uh, have been with her on and off for the last three years. And um, Terry Kristoff, part of our advisory board, said, I I've never seen this movie, The Undefeated, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. And she said, you've lived this movie. Um, and she's right. I've lived some of the experiences of this movie, but uh, I've never lived what this woman and her family have gone through over the last three years. And to go from working for, from a male politician to a female politician, I thought would be very easy and seamless. I can tell you, and you all know, it is the exact opposite. I've never seen the scrutiny that uh, she has gone through and survived over the last three years and uh, continues to and fights for what she believes in even today, as you saw her op-ed in the Wall Street Journal about crony capitalism, which somehow has now become the buzzword of the 2012 campaign. So uh, I'd like to introduce Steve Bannon. We're honored that he's joined us. He's put together this film, and I, for one, am really excited to watch it. So thank you very much, Steve, for being here. Jason, thank you. Um, it's people like, uh, you can tell a lot about people, about who they attract to work with them. And Governor Palin's team, as uh, epitomized by um, Jason, is uh, top notch. I want you to think back for a second. Um, September 18th, 2008. You know, what were you doing? What was your life like? Because that day, is probably, if not the most important date in your life, in the top three. Because it essentially is the path that led to this ballroom. At 11 o'clock in the morning on September 18th, which by the way, Governor Palin and John McCain, I believe, were leading by three points in the Gallup poll that morning. They had closed a eight-point deficit, as you're going to see in the film in a second, from August 24th in less than three weeks, they had closed the biggest gap in Gallup poll history in a presidential campaign. And I think on the morning of the 18th, they were three points up. The um, Republican appointed chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, in the um, Republican Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, went to see the sitting Republican President, George Bush, and told him that um, because of the way that the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy had been handled on Monday with no preparation and Lehman had just gone into to bankruptcy and a free fall, everybody now realized that Lehman Brothers was at the heart of the commercial paper market and the money market accounts that you guys all keep your money in. Um, and that the world economy, the world financial system, was melting down. Uh, President Bush had this briefing and sent those two guys up to Capitol Hill where they met with the senior leadership of both parties. We now know this because this meeting was very secret. Um, the memoirs of, of Hank Paulson and, and, and several participants, uh, C-SPAN had an had a, um, interview with Congressman Kanjorski, and, and what they were told is that the American financial system was going to melt down in 48 hours. That the world financial system was going to melt down by the following Monday or Tuesday. And that global unrest would start in about two or three weeks. And that the Secretary of Treasury had come up because he was asking for one trillion dollars in cash and he needed it immediately. Now, the, the 20th century is the, um, the most, it's the bloodiest century in mankind's history. Almost 200 million people died in, in wars or famines that were related to wars or because of disease that was related to war. It's by far the most barbaric century in man's history. And the United States has some tremendous enemies. 
Kaiser Wilhelm, um, the military junta in, in Japan, uh, the Nazis, Mussolini and the fascist, Lenin, Stalin, the communist. Uh, in the 21st century, we started off by having uh, Osama bin Laden. We never had an adversary or an enemy that could conceive of destroying our financial system like we did ourselves. Now, you in this room, and I think there's a hundred and some of you guys here for the, for the, uh, for the um, conference, are among the most engaged people in our country. And do you have an explanation of what happened on September 18th? Do you have a full understanding of what went on? You know, since that time, we've started to understand the, the dilemma our country's in and really the world's in. Um, we hit $15 trillion in debt last night, I think around 9 or 10 o'clock. That, that's, that's the tip, that's the tippy tip, as a kid would say, of the iceberg. Dr. Kotlikoff of Boston University uh, believes, and he's a very, Harvard PhD, runs Boston University, one of the most respected economists in the country. He actually says that our, our, our debt, our true debt, on a present value basis, the way you're taught to do it in business school, is over $200 trillion. Even conservative estimates have it at over $100 trillion, right? We, we have $2 trillion of, of unfunded student loan obligations. We have $3 trillion in fan, of, of, we have $3 trillion of, of zombie mortgages we won't face up to that are underwater. At the state level, there's a $1 trillion of unfunded pension liabilities. We have $7 trillion of, uh, of, uh, of um, trade debt. If you take up all the assets in our country, add them all up, all the stocks, all the bonds, all the private companies, the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, if you take all the cash, all the real estate, if you take all your jewelry, you take every asset we have in this country, it's about, I think, 50 to $60 trillion. And we have anywhere from obligations from 100 to $200 trillion. We have to understand something. The baby boom generation has been a participant in the destruction of our country. The, um, the solution or the set of solutions that have to be embraced and have to be um, implemented are, are, are not pleasant. All the easy choices are 10 and 15 and 20 years in back of us. All, all, all the non-painful range of alternatives we've left years ago. Every choice we have in front of us is a tough choice. And all you're being fed and, and you are the most engaged of, a, of the population is complete and total happy talk. The big budget debate we had last summer, when they talk about cutting the budget, by the way, federal budget is $3.75 trillion. The deal that they put together, which was to basically agree to budgets for two years, has federal spending in the next two years of $7.5 trillion. That's locked in. The budget cuts they were talking about that they agreed to were 61 billion dollars and they will never make those when they when you hear all these budget debate uh, talks it's not about cutting anything it's about a theoretical cut to a rate of growth in a base in an out year that's never going to happen you do understand that right it's not going to happen it's the reason the tea party was created it's the reason i've made these films and the reason I've taken a Friday night, not just to show it, but to come and talk to you, because here's the scary, really scary part, is that you are the salvation of this country. And if you guys blink, and if you guys continue to accept the happy talk and not hold people accountable, the country won't go away. We'll still be here. It'll be very different. This is the fourth great 
crisis in American history. We've had the revolution, we had the Civil War, we had the Great Depression and World War II. These happened in about 80 or 100 year cycles. This is the great fourth turning in American history. And somewhere over the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to come through this crisis. And we're either going to be the country that was bequeathed to us, or it's going to be something completely and totally different. And you've seen, and I think Occupy Wall Street's terrific. I think it's great. And you know why? I think it's a great lesson, right? It's a great, um, uh, like a Petri dish. You can kind of see it developing, right? You see it happening in Europe right now, whether it's London or Athens. You see it. You know, Europe, we're, 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 we're a country that came from the Judeo-Christian West. That Judeo-Christian West is collapsing. Okay, it's imploding. And it's imploding on our watch. And the blowback of that is going to be tremendous. I didn't make this film because of Sarah Palin. I, I did want to tell her story, but I wanted to tell her story as a device. And here's the reason. The reason it's called the undefeated is the values of tenacity and grit and common sense that has been the backbone of this country. And here was a woman who was mocked and vilified and despised. And I kind of looked around at my buddies on Wall Street in Washington, D.C., and I said, you know what? She's got a lot more accomplishments than anybody I've seen out there, right? One thing that you have to embrace is that the permanent political class she talks about in crony capitalism, they despise you. They want your money, and they want your hard work, and they want your vote. They don't want your opinion, right? You know it. You know it in your gut. It's the reason there's so much frustration. It's the reason the Tea Party, the Tea Party is not a racist uh, institution. It's not homophobic. It's not nativist. It's mad. It's angry. You know what's mad and angry about? This week, this book, Throw Them All Out by Peter Schweitzer. Governor Palin wrote her op-ed today on it. If you haven't had a chance to read the Wall Street Journal, please, please read Governor Palin's op-ed on this. Peter Schweitzer, who is part of Governor Palin's PAC, but from the Hoover Institute, took two years. I've worked with Peter for a long time, adapted a number of his books to movies. Two years, and he comes out and he shows you every different methodology of how the permanent political class, whether Republican or Democrat, enrich themselves. The joke we have to get is that there's a group of progressives up there, very dedicated, and there's a group of conservatives, and then there's an, an establishment apparatus. And that establishment apparatus has a business model, has an industrial logic. It's to enrich themselves. It's how congressmen come here, having never made more than $100,000, and in 10 years they're worth three or four million dollars, and after 20 years they're worth 15, or 15 million dollars. How does that work? His book shows you, you have to get the book. What the book brings up, which is an open secret on Capitol Hill and now shocks the nation and shocks Wall Street, is guess what? They can trade, they can trade stocks on material non-public information. On September 18th, let me step back, two days before, on September 16th, Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke knew they had made a major mistake that Lehman Brothers was in a free fall. The world's capital markets were starting to implode. They didn't know how bad it was going to be, but they went to Capitol Hill on the evening of the 16th, Tuesday, and they briefed all the members, not, not top secret, but hey, this thing's probably going the wrong way. As Peter Schweitzer shows in his book, you know what the, your members of Congress did the next day? They dumped their portfolios. That's not a victimless crime, by the way. Remember, there's somebody on the other side of that trade, an American citizen, Jim Moran, Democrat of Virginia, 90, Brother Moran, 90 positions in stocks. He, by the way, 
because we went back and checked, or Peter went back and checked his disclosures. In 2008, there are not a lot of people, even the best hedge fund, even George Soros didn't have capital gains that year. Jim Moran did. Spencer Barkas, Republican of Alabama. He comes out, he is the ranking Republican on the Financial Services and Banking Committee. One of the guys overseeing this fiasco. You know what Brother Bacchus does? After getting this secret presentation, he goes out the next morning and shorts the market. And he has the gall in the last couple of days to try to defend that. This film you're about to see, when I first made it, was X-rated. In fact, the first couple of cuts I made of this film were so repulsive that even my young editors in their 20s had a tough time watching it. Because what I did is just, I said I want to give America a wake-up call. I want to show them what Jason just talked about, what this woman's been through, right? She went through not a media, this is not Rachel Maddow and Keith Overman and all that stuff. She's gone through a pop culture beatdown that no person, George Bush included, has ever gone through. It took me five versions to get this to a PG-13. And I had to take out the violence and the vulgarity, her being crucified, her face ripped off. What they did, uh, her little son. The horrific images that grown men took their time and made. And why do they do that? It's not just the progressives. It's the establishment. She's been an anti-establishment figure from day one. And she speaks and connects. And it's the reason I wanted to make the film. I made a film called Generation Zero about the meltdown. Then I noticed in making that film that there was a populist movement that was being led for the first time in American history by women and by working class and middle class women who had not been involved in politics. And you know why? It's very simple. When I sit up here, the Harvard Business School guys, and we sit up here and we talk about 15 trillion here and 1.7 trillion dollar debts and this, trillion, trillion, trillion. It's so esoteric that guys on Wall Street don't understand it, trust me. And the guys over on Capitol Hill have no clue. But who does have a clue is the chief operating officer of the American family, and that's the mother. Because she knows every bag of groceries is a hundred bucks, and she knows every time you fill up the SUV it's a hundred bucks, and she knows she's got buddy and sis who have now completed the dream of their grandparents of a college education and are fifty thousand dollars in debt and living back in the basement in their room with all the trophies from fifth grade soccer and working as a retail clerk somewhere. Because we've taken away their 20s. We've destroyed the most productive decade they're ever going to have. The mothers know that. That's what the Tea Party Rebellion was. That's what smart girl politics is. It is people. It's you. It's women who finally said, I've had enough and I'm going to get engaged. And what did you guys deliver? You only delivered <laughs> one of the biggest political upsets in American history. The election of 2010. Give yourself a round of applause. Give yourself a round of applause. Okay, I'm going to be brutally frank. You guys are total losers. It, uh, no, what, tell me what has changed. You worked like crazy. You went out, you got engaged with no money and no support and no Republican establishment. In fact, you were mocked and vilified the entire time. Not just by the mainstream media by George Will and David Brooks and David Frum and you know all the intelligentsia on ABC, all the conservative intelligentsia, the Weekly Standard, the National Review, you were mocked and vilified. You, the, the, the election just wasn't the 74 congressmen, you eviscerated the Democratic Party in the South and the Midwest at state legislatures. And you did not get one penny of budget cuts. I want you to embrace that. You've got to own that. 
because you're not mad enough yet. You're not. You're not angry enough yet. You're going to get there. And I know you can do it. And by the way, they're scared to death of you. Right? That's where they dismiss it. Why does nobody talk about the election of 2010? Because they don't want to face the fact. This film you're about to see is called The Undefeated. The working title was um, Take a Stand about Governor Palin's campaign as governor. But I, in making the film, I realized I was making the film about you. Right? If, if this country's going to exist as it was, with all its potential and exceptionalism and greatness, it has to be you, the working men and women in this country, not the elites. Okay? We have socialism in this country. We have socialism for the very poor with a massive welfare program of food stamps and Medicaid and all that. And we have, we have welfare for the very wealthy. By the way, of that trillion dollars and all that trillion dollars, has there been any investigations? Has there been any testimony? Is there any grand jury? Well, just to make you feel good, the bonus pool on Wall Street this year is about $50 billion. Exactly the same the bonus pool was in 2007. Right? Washington, D.C., five of the seven wealthiest counties in the country. Only, only place in the United States where real estate prices are up. There's, there's no recession in the Hamptons. There's no recession in the Upper East Side. There's no recession in Georgetown. Okay? There's a recession in the rest of this country, and there's a depression in mu much of it. <laughs> Governor Palin is a more important force in our cultural and political life today than she's ever been. And if you believe for a second that any of the candidates that are wandering around somewhere between a debate in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina has a chance of beating Barack Obama, you are sadly mistaken. If the establishment wants to put up Mitt Romney, they should put up Mitt Romney. And we will have a catastrophic defeat. All you have to do is look at Ohio last week. Barack Obama with a billion dollars, all the unions, all the students in those upper Midwest states. This film was made to be a tool of empowerment for you. Governor Palin, when this film starts off, is more obscure than you've ever been in your entire life. She's working on a commercial fishing boat with her blue-collar husband. She's not part of the cultural or political or social elite in the Matsu Valley of Alaska, which is out of the loop in a state that's out of the loop. She is Walmart Nation. And that's why they fear her, detest her, and will do anything to stop her. I just want to close on one thing. Remember, when you see this film, and you see the resistance to Governor Palin, it's not Sarah Palin. It's you. They don't want to hear your voice. They want to shut you down. They don't give a damn what you think. As long as you write the checks, they're fine. And one day, and I think that day is coming soon, you're going to be mad enough to do something about it. Thank you very much.